Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are very glad to be holding this briefing this afternoon uh, entitled, Find Out How Many Solar Jobs Were Created in Your State. Uh, and I think that's very important to note that even as we are coming out of an ice storm, and we're so glad that everybody is here, uh, and that the sun came out and uh, allowed us to actually be able to get down sidewalks uh, and be able to tra traverse to, to work and uh, to this briefing today, that we're very, very glad that we are here to talk about the whole role of solar jobs. Because once again this year, um, the, the Solar Foundation had commissioned a study of really looking at doing a solar job census. And this has been going on for a few years now. It's really, really an important area to take a look at what really is happening in terms of jobs in this important sector, how they are developing, what are the trends. And we're going to hear from a whole panel of people who are involved in closely looking at uh, this sector and who are involved in the industry as well as really looking at it from a policy perspective and looking at what this has meant in terms of the investments that have also been made by the Department of Energy in terms of seeing costs come down, uh, all of which was a part of the original goal in terms of really looking at how to make solar a very competitive technology that could tap an enormous resource across this country for Americans. So this is all a very important part of a very important global story, which you're going to hear more about. But in terms of looking at what is really happening here in the United States uh, to uh, provide information about this solar census, we are going to turn first to Andrea Lukey, who is the president and executive director of the Solar Foundation. And it is through Andrea's leadership that the Solar Foundation has been looking at this important issue, developing all sorts of information about the solar industry. Uh, what, what are the needs? What are the trends? Uh, what are the success stories? What are hurdles? And so we are very pleased to have Andrea present this initial report. Thank you so much, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Senator Reed's office for sponsoring us and securing this nice room for us today. My name is Andrea Lukey. I'm the President and Executive Director of the Solar Foundation. I'm here to talk about our research, our National Solar Job Census report series, as well as our state solar jobs numbers. Before I dig into the findings and the results, I would like to say a few words about the Solar Foundation. The Solar Foundation is an independent C3 nonprofit whose mission is to increase understanding of solar energy through strategic research that educates the public and transforms markets. We are based here in Washington, DC. We've been around since the 70s. And all of our reports, research, findings, programs can be found at thesolarfoundation.org. So as Carol mentioned, I'm here to talk about our National Solar Jobs Census 2014 report series. This is our fifth iteration of this report, and we are, it is considered to be the authority on employer numbers, jobs numbers, trends. We're looking at wages, occupations, employer perceptions, job numbers, projections, et cetera. We look at everything. We survey hundreds of thousands of companies, and we get thousands of responses back from solar companies nationwide. In 2014, we have found that there are 174,000 solar workers nationwide, solar jobs and solar companies in all 50 states. This is up 31,000 new solar jobs since 2013, and up 80,000 since we first started tracking solar jobs in 2010. Next year, all right, I suppose it's this year, in 2015, the outlook is equally as bright. Employers are expecting to grow their payrolls by about 36,000 new jobs. That's about 20.9% uh, job growth rate. 
Now, how does this compare with the overall economy? Pretty well. Um, if you look at uh, how the overall economy has been sort of sluggishly improving, right now we have unemployment at about 5.7%, which is not bad compared to what it was several years ago. But still, the solar industry is creating jobs nearly 20 times faster than the overall economy. One in every 78 new jobs in the overall economy was created in the solar industry. I think that's a pretty significant number when you think about how small the solar industry is compared to some of the other industries like healthcare, or IT. We break out jobs by sector. So we look at installation, we look at manufacturing, how many jobs are in the project development, how many jobs are in sales and distribution, how many jobs are in the other sector. And what we have found is that about 56% of all solar jobs are in the installation sector, are considered installers, followed by manufacturing, sales and distribution, project development, et cetera. Right now, there are 97,000 installers. And the solar installation sector employs more American workers than coal miners right now. Another important aspect of the solar industry is that it's, it's very diverse. It's increasingly diverse in terms of the number of women, Latino, Hispanic, veterans, Asian or Pacific Islanders, or African Americans. In 2013, we started tracking demographics for the first time. And over the last 12 months, we have found all um, of these types of people increase in terms of their percentage, and increase in terms of their numbers. This slide represents how important or unimport unimportant experience or education is to the average solar employer. And what I find fascinating about this is that companies are really not that interested in education. They're really looking for experience. So if you are a person who maybe only has a GED or was recently discharged from the military, you have a better chance of getting a job in the solar industry than in many other industries. What, what solar companies are looking for is hands-on technical experience. And there are many occupations within the solar industry that, that allow for that. And the reason why this is important is because these jobs pay well. The average solar installer makes $24 an hour. The average salesperson in the solar industry makes $36 an hour. So not only do you not have to have a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD, but you also make pretty good money. These are considered very livable wages. That said, companies are experiencing difficulty finding the right people, increasingly so. Now, we're not yet at a crisis level, but it does tell us that we need to continue to put resources into bridging the gap between those that want to work in solar, those that are providing training for solar workers, and companies that are looking to increase their payrolls with skilled individuals. Now, in terms of our state research, this is what, this is what we released last month. Um, we released six detailed jobs reports, job census reports, for six different states with jobs and demographic information broken out at the legislative district level. So these reports are for Arizona, California, New York, Texas, Maryland, and Georgia. So for those of you that represent somebody from, from one of those states, we have, as I mentioned, legislative district level de, um, information available. We also release jobs numbers for all 50 states. So we, we look at all states, we rank them, we look at their electricity pricing, we look at their jobs per capita, we look at their growth rate, we look at the number of companies that are in the state. And in terms of the states that have the most solar jobs, California is the undisputed leader with about 55,000 of the 174,000 solar workers. So about one third of the solar workers are in California, which is I think no surprise given how long 
uh, longstanding their policies and, and, and support has been. That said, California has six times the number of solar workers than the number two state, which is Massachusetts, at about 9,000. And then Arizona, New York, New Jersey. Uh, Nevada was the big breakout this year in terms of growth, in terms of where it places within uh, the other state, among the other states in terms of um, jobs per capita. Between 2013 and 2014, it experienced a growth rate of 146%. So it just really exploded. Um, other states that were exploding over the last 12 months are Minnesota, Illinois, North Carolina, and Texas. All of this information and more can be found on our website. We have this um, interactive map at solarstates.org where you can click on the state you're interested in and see how it compares with its neighbors. And then of course the detailed reports, the census reports for those six states can be found on our website as well. Um, thank you so much. I do look forward to answering your questions. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. You're welcome. We will now turn to someone who can talk very specifically about jobs as uh, he is involved uh, as a senior vice president and Chief Human Resources Officer for Sun Edison. And we are very glad that Matt Hertzberg is here with us today, and especially considering that because of his whole role, uh, he just flew in from India last night, and so we're lucky that he made it in through the ice and everything else. But I think one of the things that's, that's also important, that while he's been with Sun Edison since 2011, he brings an enormous amount of of experience in terms of working with uh, Fortune 100 companies, working in the utility, in the insurance, and in uh, the financial services areas. So it's a terrific background to bring to this really large, growing, uh, important Sun Edison company. And I think that it will be very, very useful to think about what he can tell us about trends here as well as globally and how Sun Edison looks at it. And after all, he is all about jobs. Matt? Well, thank you, Carol. And um, Carol is exactly right. It was 85 degrees when I left Chennai, and that was at 11 o'clock at night. So uh, it was qu quite a shock coming into uh, Dulles last night. Um, but anyway, I'm glad to be here. Uh, here's what I want to do. I have about 10 minutes, and I'm uh, really about three things I want to cover. So first of all, I do want to build upon some of the work that Andrea presented and, and maybe take it down to the ground floor level in terms of what we're seeing, and then maybe uh, talk a little bit about why that's happening, I think, because there's something driving that job growth, and it's and to understand that I think would be very important to understand uh, the job. So really I thought I'd, I'd take some time just introducing our company, what we do, why we do the things that we're doing. Maybe that's even more important than what we do is why we do it. Um, secondly, I wanted to discuss the business opportunities, and I'm, I'm going to take mostly a U.S. perspective, obviously because of the audience, but also I think there's some things I want to talk about globally, because I think if you look at solar growth globally, and then to really think about we as a U.S. and our U.S. economy and how do we want to lead this, this revolution that we're on the, on the verge of, or do we want to be a laggard? Um, I think it's one of the policy decisions we need to think about. And I, the third thing I want to talk about specifically about how we're uh, approaching some of the challenges that Andrea talked about in, in terms of our workforce. And, um, and I think what you'll find is that we're approaching it in a very assertive maybe even aggressive manner, and very innovative at the same time, because uh, we think uh, having individuals who are qualified and who can not only have great jobs but also make uh, really good pay at the same time is something that's good for everybody, good for us as a company, good for the economy, good for the nation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about who we are. And for some, oh, there we are. there's a build there. I didn't know there was a build there. Um, so we are the largest uh, renewable energy development company in the world right now. 
And um, we were actually founded, though, in 1959 under the, the name MEMC, which uh, we had all the original patents on pure silicon. So those things that are in your phones and in the cameras and in the computer, that's all of our original technology. And, and so you'll see how that innovation is very, very important as we move forward as a company. Fortune 1000 company, about 3,000 employees worldwide, not including our semiconductor group, which has been spun off into a separate company now. And we're responsible for more than 1,000 solar and wind projects across the entire globe. So and with that said, we are really a leader if you look at the supply chain, um, especially in terms of solar, because um, as opposed to some of our other uh, competitors, I mean, we are differentiated globally, so we have a presence in every major market across the entire globe. We um, not only install solar panels, but we, we make the polysilicon that goes into them, we cut the wafers, we have JVs that make the cells in the, in the panels, um, we have the development companies, the financing, and then also we have uh, a company called Terraform, which is actually a yield vehicle to where we put our assets into that and they manage the assets. So we have the full supply chain. And then the final piece is uh, we also have markets in the, what's known as the utility sector, the commercial distributed generation sector, and also residential. So, uh, and you can see here that we've experienced tremendous growth since we first ventured into solar in, in uh, 2009. Um, that is an annual growth rate of, of 94%. And going into 2015, that's what we'll experience again. So those numbers, that, that nice big number right there at one gigawatt will almost double by this time next year. So pretty, pretty exciting. So what's, what's, what's really behind that, that growth? Well, we have to look at just what are the, the, the solar installations in the United States. And you can see here, similar type of growth to what you just saw in terms of our business. Right. Now, some of these out here are expected. You can see 2015, 2016 are estimated, um, estimated numbers. So you can see that's uh, a, a nice uh, a run. Now, the question that you might have as policy people is what, what happens after ITC uh, begins to expire in 2017? You know, some of the estimates I've seen, that number might drop off. But here's what I'm here to tell you is that if it drops off, it'll be a temporary drop off. Because what we are part of here is a, is a global um, change in, in the way that energy is delivered. And so while there might be a temporary uh, downturn in the United States economy, over time it's going to catch up again. And that's driven by a couple things. Uh, one is just the price of, of PV. Solar is the only fuel source in the world right now that has a decreasing price curve. Everything else is increasing. Okay, So that will continue to draw, drive some of this demand. Um, the second thing is, is, you know, I think that we have to consider, do we want to be a leader or a lagger in terms of the global revolution? Here is what's going on in the globe, okay? So by 2020, there'll be over 100 gigawatts of, of PV installed. Okay. Now, if we were to look at renewables, which would include also wind, solar, and uh, hydro, and maybe some uh, biomass, What's remarkable about this, I didn't make a chart on this, but what we would have found in 2013, there were actually more installations of wind, solar, and biomass than there were of nuke, um, oil, gas, and coal. Okay? By 2020, it almost doubled. So just to give you those numbers, in, in last year it was 87 megawatts in terms of coal, nuclear, and gas, and it was 100, uh, over 100 uh, gigawatts, gigawatts, I'm sorry if I said megawatts, of renewables. Okay, by 2020, that goes up to that goes to 78 in terms of, of your traditional fossil sources and nuclear, and it goes to 140 in terms of gigawatts of installed uh, renewables. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the world economy. So then the question becomes, um, you know, in order to compete in that for a limited labor force, as, as we already talked, so that we can meet this demand, but with this la limited labor force, what, what is it that we're going to do? A couple things. So good wages is, is just the start of this. But our thought is, is we have to create a world-class culture, you know, the best place to work and an environment to go along with that. Um, this means enabling people to show up and be at their best every single day. And we've thought about this in a couple uh, ways. So one is, is to have that culture with a great value statement and, and things that, that, that really make sense for us. Um, but the second thing is, is to make sure that, that we're really serious about it in terms of our benefits. So some of the things that we've done is we've actually reduced our, um, 
our premiums on our insurance. We've actually increased our insurance coverage, which is absolutely the opposite of the trend of everything else. But it makes sense. Our business trend is opposite. Why wouldn't our benefits trend be opposite of everybody else, right? Um, and that's, that's, you know, in fact, if you're an employee, you, it's zero coverage. I mean, you, you pay nothing for your coverage. We, we automatically uh, cover all employees. Um, second thing is, you know, we, we've increased our tuition assistance. We have one of the best 401ks in the entire country in terms of our retirement. Um, our maternity leave is 16 weeks. Our paternity leave is four weeks. Um, and we also have what's known, in addition to our long-term and short-term disability benefits, we have what we call compassionate care. And what that means is if, if an employee is terminally ill, okay, we will cover their full salary for at least three years. Okay? If they expire, which is what we don't want, but if that happens, um, we will actually cover 50% of their wages for 10 years for their survivors. In addition, for terminally ill employees who, who have fam or for family members uh, who are terminally ill, we will give people up to six months leave. So that's what we're doing in terms of attracting high profile pe or high uh, quality people to our organization. And then finally here, we want to diverse, we want to focus on diversity and, and veteran hiring for all those reasons that Andrea said. But in addition to that, for diversity, you know, we understand that it's the reality of the workplace, that the workplace is becoming more and more diverse, right? So if we're going to compete in that workplace, we have to be a diverse organization as well, because what we know is diverse organizations have uh, an advantage over non-diverse organizations in terms of recruiting diverse talent. Second reason is we're in a very complex, nascent industry, which means things are going to constantly evolve, and, and it's very, very complex. And, and so what we know about diverse organizations is they tend to be better decision makers when you have a diverse business environment, right? And so that's, that's very fundamental. Also, we want to make sure that we're reflecting the communities that we serve and, and our, our potential uh, customer bases. And I think the final piece there in terms of diversity, it's just the right thing to do. And what it does is it absolutely fits with our purpose. Our purpose is to transform lives through innovation. And that started, as I said, in the semiconductor industry, which we have done through all those nice cell phones and everything else that you have in your hands. Um, but more fundamental in that, when we think about transforming lives, we think about what we can do um, as an organization. And so in a developed nation like ours, what that means to us is, is green, sustainable, affordable energy for people, right? And when I say sustainable, it's also reducing some of those bad things that we don't like, like SO2 and nitrogen oxide and, and CO2 and particle matters and particulate matters and, and mercury that, that comes out of it, not to mention nuclear waste, right? So we can eliminate some of those. So in terms of improving the quality of life, but even more fundamental in that is the quantity of life itself. And let me explain that. If you look at life expectancy, okay, the availability of electricity is directly correlated to life expectancy. Right now, there are 1.5 billion people in the world that do not have access to electricity. Okay? In India alone, it's 300 million. That's the population of the United States. And that's why Prime Minister Modi is, is so interested in, in, in solar. Um, but what that means is if you look at life expectancy in those areas, life expectancy is about 50 years old. 50 years old. In areas with electricity, it jumps up to about 78 or roughly where we're at, depending on where you're at in the world, 50 years old. So we can not only impact the quality of life, but the quantity of life itself. And that's, that's what we're about as an organization. And because of that, we've partnered with all kinds of foundations worldwide to really make an impact and make a difference, to put our money where our mouth is, in, in essence. In the United States, there's two things that we're doing in terms of along the lines of, of diversity of workforce, but also making sure that, that we can account um, or we can bring renewables. Hmm. I might have to talk to the rest of this. Hold on. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll, yeah, 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 that's okay. I can, I can keep talking, so I know what the next slide's going to be. I'm not sure what's go. going on. Hmm, seems still frozen. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll, no problem. Try to <laughs> so I'll talk about two things. So the first is... Um, there's a partnership that we have with Grid Alternatives. And the first one is Women in Leadership. Thank you, Andrew. That's even better. OK. <laughs> um, so it's a Women in Leadership initiative that we'll talk about in a second. But what this, what this particular um, uh, initiative is, is to do is to give 1,000 women um, across the, the United States training 
in the installation of solar. We also have 20 paid internships, or fellowships as, as we refer to, where these will be year-long fellowships to learn all different types, types of jobs in solar. Um, there will also be some educational networking opportunities with that. And the whole thing with Grid Alternatives, what they do is they install solar on low-income um, families' houses. Okay, so, so to really help uh, families reduce their, their energy dependence and, and to be more independent and, uh, and uh, to bring a certain cost structure there. So that's, that's what we have there. Second one I'll just reach across here. is um, something that we call RISE, or a new initiative called RISE. I think it might be this thing. There you go. And RISE is, um, is a program that we have that, that really is, is partnering, again, with Grid Alternatives. Uh, two years, $5 million is, is what we are, are actually donating. Now, some of that's in cash and some of that's in panels. And the whole idea is to really increase recruitment in underserved communities, um, to make sure that, that we have real-world experience for at least 4,000 individuals. So, again, that point that Andrea made, that it's, it's having those skill sets and that knowledge uh, that enables people to get jobs, and another 40 paid in internships. And then there's some readiness issues and in terms of getting people ready to take those jobs and then also referral job banks and those types of things. So that's, that's what we're really super excited about, is, is to put our money where our mouth is and to really make a difference in the world and transform lives, not only in terms of quality and quantity of life, but also the ability of people to, to actually get real, real jobs uh, at good wages. And, and this is what we're thinking about just in the United States alone. We will hire about 600 people next year, 600 to 700, depending on the estimates. And these are the types of jobs that we will be hiring in. Um, our operations jobs, finance services. Why you might ask why finance so high is because part of what we do is we actually finance a lot of these projects. And so it's not just your traditional finance people, but it's also your project finance folks that we bring in and, and would lump into those categories. Um, now, one of the questions you might have is, is with uh, grid alternatives, their focus is primarily on installation, although they, their, their training programs do more than just installation. It hits, they have things that hit each one of these. Um, but we really don't hire a lot of installers. It's just not our business model. We work with the engineering, procurement, and construction companies to do a lot of that work for us. But what we realize is that those installation jobs, they are the feedstock of all the other jobs in the industry. And that's why we're willing, even if it doesn't directly benefit us, we're, we're, uh, you, we think this is important enough that we want to make sure that, that we're uh, doing this for the entire, for the entire industry is good. And we hope that some of the other folks in the industry will really uh, maybe uh, follow some of the stuff that we're doing. We welcome that. So thank you. Appreciate your time. Great. Thanks so much, Matt. And uh, right before the briefing, I was just mentioning to him that I had also heard, um, uh, based upon conversations with folks in New York State in terms of uh, their community colleges that are doing solar certification for training, you know, for training installers, et cetera, that, um, that their program basically, um, they just need more people because everybody that goes through their program, they have been able to place. So that it's, again, one of these things in terms of that there are a lot of jobs that are being created that are available. Now it's, it's um, a, a case of, of making sure that there are people in this workforce to, um, to be there for those positions. So now we will turn to Amit Ronan who is the director of the George Washington University Solar Institute, and Amid is also uh, a professor at the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy at George Washington University. And of course, some of you may know him from the many years he spent here in the Senate um, on Senator Maria Cantwell's staff working on, on energy and a whole variety of other issues. Amid. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. And thanks for organizing another great briefing. Thank you. All right. So uh, I was asked today to talk a little bit about the uh, policy trends. That's what we do at the GW Solar Institute, look at some of the public policy barriers that are going on with the solar energy world. And so I guess the, another way to, to ask the question is, well, where are all these jobs coming from? Why, why is solar growing? 20 times the national average that it did last year and the year before that, and what's the future look like? 
So here's a big part of the story. You just see these are different sectors of the industry. It's generally termed out to be uh, residential. That's sort of your, your rooftops. Non-residential, that's like your commercial spaces like Walmart. And utility, that's your big solar arrays in the desert. All the costs are coming down very quickly. And it's really remarkable. It's an 80% drops in the PV panel prices in the last five years. So if you think about that, well, if that would have happened in the nuclear industry, we'd probably have a very different conversation about what the future of the nuclear industry is. is. But it's not, as Matt was mentioned. Uh, solar is the only technology. I mean, there are a few others debatable, like wind and such. But the uh, cost curves are, are really driving down costs. And since this technology was really first tried to be commercialized in the early 70s, the costs have come down uh, 99%. So when Jimmy Carter was talking about we should all go solar, it was a very different playing field than what we're talking about today. So then if you look, uh, well, what's the future hold? Uh, these are the uh, Energy Department sunshot goals. I think Mike will be talking a lot more about that, but this is an important reference point. So you have, uh, they have a goal that was an ambitious goal they set in 2010 and say, hey, within 10 years, can we get down to basically price parity, uh, six cents, or sometimes it's considered one, $1 per watt for utility scale. Uh, but important thing just to look at the trend lines here, there's two important ones. One, you have the PV module costs, so what I was just talking about. We're pretty much there. I mean, we're talking about a couple cents that will decrease in the future. But that has gotten down so low that uh, even, even if panel prices were free, you still have this other two-thirds of the costs, which are called soft costs or, or uh, balance of system costs. So that's everything else related to the industry uh, putting up a system. So we're talking about labor, like the jobs here, the installation, the permitting. The uh, customer acquisition is a big, big part of that. So that a lot of the stuff that Sunshot is working on addresses those particular cost barriers. And so taken together, you see this chart, which is similar to the one that Matt had. You got costs coming down very quickly, and you got installations going up uh, extremely quickly. Um, the final 2014 numbers aren't out yet, but you can see basically estimated where they are. We'll have those in another month or two. And there's a, uh, a mix between the photovoltaics which is one, that's sort of your typical uh, standard panel, and then concentrating solar power, which is used as a thermal energy of the sun to also generate electricity. Those are usually in larger arrays that you, uh, you see in more desert situations. Um, but this being said, I mean, there's an important note here. There's a lot of growth, obviously, but still solar's uh, going to be less than 1% of the uh, national generation in probably this year or so. I mean, we'll see where the numbers come out. So there's a long way. You could, I guess the positive spin is a lot of room for solar to grow, but also that, you know, this is still a nascent technology that is, is getting out of the gate. Um, there were some interesting numbers and predictions that came out of the International Energy Agency uh, a few months ago, typically uh, thought to be a pretty conservative organization in their, in their uh, analysis, but they found that within a couple decades, that solar would be the number one uh, generation source in the world. Not a majority, they'd be 25% total under their calculations, but more than nuclear, more than natural gas, more than any other single source. All right, so uh, the important thing, the linkage here between this growth and jobs is all those places you're seeing where the, where the uh, installs are, that's also where all the jobs are. And that is one uh, unique thing about solar in a way, because when you're putting up a solar uh, project, particularly on distributed generation, like on rooftops and on commercial scale, that job is there. It's local. The person has to be hired from typically the the community, and uh, and it's a good a good job opportunity, as as Andrea talked about, for you know people who might not have a college degree, but they can still get a living wage job through this new new opportunities are, that are there. So this, that's in solar installation, according to the census, was 56% of all, all of the installs. But actually, interestingly, all of these new jobs, the 31,000, uh, nine out of 10 of them almost were from solar installation jobs. So that's where the, the industry is really taking off. To these jobs, it can't be outsourced. Um, and then uh, a little bit of a repeat for, from what uh, Andrea mentioned about California. But well, there's some interesting trends. They're still booming. California, of course, being a larger economy, so it's not necessarily fair to compare them to other states, but they have been 
very committed to seeing a solar future there for uh, ahead of the game uh, compared to other states, and now they're reaping their rewards. So they not only created 7,500 new jobs in 2014, but they're expecting 10,000 new solar jobs there in that country, in that uh, state, I mean. <laughs> Some people call it a country. And uh, other ones, Nevada, uh, of course, now being number one solar jobs per, pack, per capita, California is actually number four. And then uh, one other important trend I wanted to mention here on, the, on this correlation is that another interesting finding coming out of the census was that uh, it now only takes 15.5 jobs on average per megawatt installed, and that is a decline of about 25% from 2012 when it was uh, around 19.5. So the industry is growing, but also it is becoming more efficient. So that gets back to where that, that curve that I, you saw on the soft cost, it's a very important factor because installation is a, is a really big uh, cost driver right now. And I didn't want to forget about solar manufacturing. Uh, that's about 20% of the uh, total job picture, 19%. And so there's some interesting trend lines to pick up here too. So we had a, definitely had a trough in 2012. Uh, we had some good years, came down, I won't get into all the factors, but uh, you know, it had to do with the economy, a lot of big investment, uh, government investment in China uh, in terms of where they wanted to go, but the uh, U.S. is coming back there, so that's a 275% increase from our low in, in 2012. And we also, there's a lot of other manufacturing besides uh, photovoltaics, I, I should mention, that happens here in the U.S. too. There's solar water heaters, which is an important part of this industry. There's the CSP materials. A lot of uh, films and high-value IP stuff is manufactured here in the U.S. and shipped abroad where it's, where it's assembled. All right, so that's uh, some of the trends. I wanted to go a little more into what we're seeing from a, a meta level. So we got the solar employment growth. We talked about that. 20% uh, increase expected next year. Uh, another... Good news story, sunny trend for, uh, for this industry is essentially there's a lot of public support. We got 80% uh, of Americans in a recent poll said they wanted to see solar and wind increase a lot and 10% wanted to increase somewhat, so that's 90% total, which is interesting because only 1% of Americans are getting their power from it, but a lot of people want to see a solar future. And then uh, I thought... Another interesting poll, this is from Gallup last year, that two-thirds of Americans supported spending more government money on developing solar energy. Uh, we have a huge number of drivers in terms of uh, government and business. I won't go through all those in the interest of time, but uh, this administration is playing a big leadership role in trying to get renewables out through executive orders, the, the nation's largest Electricity provider, the U.S. military is looking at getting three gigawatts of, of power from renewables, and a lot, big chunk of that is coming from solar. Uh, the Department of Interior is opening up 25, uh, well, just a, a lot of land in, in uh, the West in particular that's, that's uh, managed by the federal government for solar energy. So those are important. And then on the business side, you've got some of America's most profitable and, and uh, essentially biggest businesses saying, they, they think solar makes sense from their bottom line. A lot of them have readily admitted that is, they're not doing this for environmental reasons, but it just makes sense. So Walmart is the largest solar installer in the country. They got over 250 uh, sites. You got uh, Apple a couple weeks ago announced they're going to spend $850 million on a single uh, facility in California, and the power generated there would be enough, the equivalent to power everything they need in California. So their big headquarters, their server farms, all of their retail stores. And these guys are thinking, well, I can lock in a source that's I know what it's going to cost. I never have to worry about fuel costs increasing in the future. I can be green at the same time. And uh, the economics really work for them. Uh, and one other trend I wanted to mention, which is important, is that the reality is the U.S. is a bit of a, a bit player in, in this in terms of where the growth is. I think uh, Matt was, wasn't in India visiting family, but Sun Edison has a lot of uh, looking. They've announced some. I won't get any proprietary stuff, but they've announced that uh, there's some great market opportunities in India. Uh, we have labored hard to get the solar industry basically to, we'll probably 
reach 20 gigawatts this year, which is a be a big milestone for the U.S. Uh, but we are the guys who invented the technology and, and brought it through all these decades. China wants 40 gigawatts by next year, and other places have these enormous goals. Uh, Saudi Arabia, places where um, you would think, well, why would they do it? A lot of economics behind it and a lot of trends that it makes sense for them. So um, a lot, it's good for the U.S. because they see we are leaders in some of the business models and the financing and things like that, and under the countries around the world are asking for our expertise and to help them grow their economies. But not all is uh, happy in uh, sunny. Sometimes it's cloudy. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly go over some of these. We can get into more of these during the discussion if, if uh, people are interested. But we're seeing, uh, particularly in areas where the solar penetration rates are, are the highest or they're starting to really, uh, really take a cut at a, what is a fixed pie in terms of electricity uh, sales rates that utilities in particular, uh, not all utilities, but a number of utilities have been aggressively trying to slow distributed solar growth, basically rooftop solar on homes in particular. And uh, that's gotten ugly in a lot of places. We see, uh, we're, we're seeing some localities where you have a 30-second ad campaign style commercials, which are very low information, but just try and get you, as those kind of attack ads do, on both sides. And uh, the battles are being played out in the legislature, on state regulatory commissions, places where you don't usually, people don't pay attention. But it's pretty important for the future of solar. Um, there are uh, a lot of uncertainties regarding the uh, incentives that have underpinned much of this growth in solar. Uh, Matt mentioned again the, the ITC, that's the investment tax credit. Uh, there was a very important uh, law that Congress passed in 2008, October 2008, which provided a 30% investment tax credit for both commercial and residential solar. And the, there were a few important things there. One very important thing is that it was an eight-year credit, and that eight-year certainty really allowed the industry to grow for people to make long-term investment decisions. All those big solar manufacturers, uh, solar Concentrating solar plants and others that take years to build, if they didn't have the certainty that knowing that this would last through 2016, they wouldn't have happened. But now we're almost at 2016. And so we're going to see the next year there's going to be a tremendous amount of rapid growth. The, the industry is again saying they're going to have a 20% increase. But, uh, so that's all good. But then we have a cliff situation where it drops down to 10% for commercial. It goes away for residential. And that's never good for a industry's growth because you're going to have a bunch of people hired next year and then what happens after that they're not going to have the same amount of orders they're rushing them all to today so i think some policymakers, even though solar is almost there on the price parity within a couple of years uh is there a better way to do this through say ramping down those incentives gradually in a predictable way that industry can bank on and, and uh, financing can happen behind it uh i put in one one uh, a little bit more on this because it's a hot topic in Congress and it, we had some interesting uh, results coming out of the, the census. Basically, three out of four businesses said that the investment tax credit was very important to them. It significantly helped their business. Uh, the solar installation sector thought even stronger that 88% said that the ITC was vital to their sector. But... They're notable that about 40% of the respondents to this uh, big census, and we had thousands and 7,000 or so respondents, uh, said that uh, lowering the ITC to 10% wouldn't uh, impact their workforce. So uh, there are a lot of uh, solar-related jobs that aren't necessarily tied directly to the ITC. So first there's uh, solar water pool heaters, they don't get the ITC anyways, but also people who are exporting, uh, people who are manufacturers, who, uh, who are not that tied to the direct uh, ITC. But I think in general, there's, there's some uh, concern about that cliff nature and that uh, any rapid change is, is just going to cause churn and uh, slow down, which is what could be a, a continuing success story. Okay, two other uh, trends for you. So we have the solar trade war. Uh, some of you may have heard of. This is a long and complicated, but essentially uh, there was a U.S. solar manufacturer, a, a 
a, uh, who petitioned the Obama administration before the WTO to ask, saying that the Chinese were dumping panels uh, here in the U.S., basically producing panels and selling them at below their cost to hurt the domestic manufacturers. The Obama administration took up their case. There were tariffs placed on those panels, countervailing tariffs, tariffs placed on other components of the solar uh, supply chain by China. So what it results in essentially is a, those co panels cost more for U.S. installers because they have to pay this tariff on top of it, and so that drives up costs. And again, a lot of uncertainty there about how this will all play out and a generally a negative drag on what's going on. And uh, then we have a, you know, even an important thing to remember is that where solar has, is in a competitive playing field and there are a lot of incumbent technologies that are both uh, been around for a long time. They don't necessarily uh, have to pay for all their externalities, uh, particularly fossil fuels, of course, and, and the related pollution is not, uh, not, into, not placed into the cost of, so, of their production of energy. And so that is a, and they also have a lot of uh, existing subsidies uh, people debate on what levels those are. The Obama administration's budget proposes, for example, to uh, remove $50 billion in fossil fuel subsidies that have been around for a couple decades. So, but that's an important trend to consider when there's a lot of debates about who gets subsidized where and, and for what, that uh, you have to look at the bigger picture. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks, Amit. So we've heard a variety of things talked about, and, and any number of times the conversation has gone back to thinking about things that the Department of Energy has been involved with. And, I, and our last speaker on this panel is Mike Carr, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. Uh, I think th what's really important here, too, is that the Department of Energy, in its role in terms of looking at R&D and uh, technology development deployment, uh, looking at kind of the, the hurdles, the barriers, uh, how, how things need to be addressed, partnerships with the private sector, and the whole role that it has played over the last few decades and in conjunction also with uh, legislation that has been passed by Congress, both on the policy and obviously on the tax side, and, and the Department of Energy and other um, uh, parts of the administration have been responsible for the implementation of that. So we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, what has happened uh, in terms of DOE's story from, um, from Mike. And I should also mention that he brings uh, a lot of experience also from the Hill in that he was the senior counsel uh, up here on the Senate side for the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee for a number of years. Mike? Just using the arrow case. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, th thanks, Carol and, and, and Andrea and the Solar Foundation team, as well as Amit and the GW Solar Institute for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's it's uh, and also all this important work that we're talking about today. I also wanted to give a special thanks to Matt and, uh, and Sun Edison for your contributions to the solar industry. Um, as, as Matt was talking about uh, just a few weeks ago, Sun Edison partnered with uh, Grid Alternatives to launch an initiative that will provide hands-on uh, solar installation training for job seekers, and, and then connect them with solar companies looking to hire. Uh, this is the, the kind of partnerships that we really value and I think can be uh, a, a really a key to growing the, the industry. So uh, as Carol said, I'm the, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for EERE, um, and our, we view our job to try to ensure American leadership in the global transition to a clean energy economy. So we work towards that goal by supporting some of America's best innovators and businesses in researching, developing, and demonstrating while, and deploying cutting edge technologies. And by working to break down some of the market barriers 
across our three energy pillars, uh, sustainable transportation, energy saving homes, buildings and manufacturing, and this solar in the renewable electricity generation space. So I wanna talk a little bit about ERE to try to provide a little bit of context uh, on, the, on the price drivers um, that we see uh, for the solar industry. So uh, for us, that's through the SunShot initiative. SunShot was launched in 2001, uh, sorry, 2011. Uh, to drive research, manufacturing, and market solutions to make the abundant U.S. solar energy resources more affordable and accessible for Americans. Since its launch, SunShot has funded hundreds of projects in the following areas. Solar photovoltaics, concentrating solar power, soft costs, systems integration, and the technology to market. So we're working to make solar energy fully cost competitive with traditional energy sources before the end of this decade. And already, thanks to SunShot and our industry partners, solar, uh, solar generated electricity is now on par with traditional energy sources in seven states across the US, including California, Hawaii, Texas, and Minnesota. It's clear we're making progress and incredibly quickly. So since SunShot's inception, the average price of a utility scale photovoltaic project, where, uh, or PV, refers to a solar panel-based project that has dropped from about $3.80 a watt to uh, about $1.68 a watt. And only halfway through SunShot's 10-year initiative, the solar industry is already 70% of the way to achieving the SunShot cost target of a dollar per watt. This will translate into about six cents a kilowatt hour for utility scale PV. And on the residential side, we've seen a similar dramatic drop in prices, where the average price per watt has decreased from about 660 when SunShot was launched to $3.12 per watt in 2014. And so since 2010, the average cost of solar PV panels has dropped more than 60%. And solar PV system costs overall have dropped about 50% of what, of what they were three years ago. So SunShot is well on its way to achieving its cost reduction goals by 2020. But, and, and importantly, because we've made this, this, this amount of progress on the, on the manufacturing side and on the cellular side, uh, soft costs have now become an increasing part of, of the remaining cost that we need to squeeze out of the system. So we call these, we call these things soft costs. They, they include everything from permitting to customer acquisition, connecting the grid, and the financing. So an example, is even though the hardware costs are comparable, the installed cost of solar in Germany is less than half the cost of installing solar in California. So almost $5 a watt in California, where about $2.25 a watt in Germany. So there are a lot of factors that contribute to these cost differences, but this shows that there's still a lot of potential to lower PV costs, system prices in the US, even beyond reducing the hardware costs. So SunShot right now is funding, uh, is funding and has funded uh, hundreds of projects that are making every step of going, going solar more affordable, from streamlining panel manufacturing processes to cutting the red tape involved in the installation. So for example, in, in 2011, SunShot launched the Rooftop Solar Challenge, which provides teams from across the country with funding to come up with innovative solutions to make solar, the solar installation process cheaper, faster, and easier. And in the second phase, launched in 2013. So the combined effort of 22 teams from 19 states in Puerto Rico helped to cut permitting time by 40% and reduce fees by more than 10% by putting permitting and plug-in approval processes online for millions of Americans. This helps ratepayers through group purchasing programs and driving down total system costs by about 20%, shortening permitting wait time by 40% and reducing permitting fees by 12%. And so as we all know, time is money. So the quicker solar can be installed, the cheaper it becomes, and which creates this positive feedback cycle of lower costs and continually growing markets. So let me walk a little bit through uh, our, our priorities for funding. So as these, these achievements are becoming more broadly recognized, including by Congress, 
and EERE has seen a pretty steady increase in our budget for the past 10 years. So our FY16 uh, budget request reflects the administration's strong continuing commitment to clean energy with increases across all of our sectors. But to highlight the solar program specifically, the proposed budget of $336 million would support all of these, the goals that I've already articulated, including in particular uh, reducing soft costs, training new installers, and in, in improving our comparative advantage in manufacturing in the United States. But we're here to talk about job growth. So as, as we've heard, uh, this is a rapidly growing industry that is driving job creation in the United States. Just in the last year, the solar industry added 31,000 new jobs. For, and, and so we, we believe uh, in the SunShot Initiative, in particular in an EERE, that solar is the, great, the next great American industry, fueling economic growth by providing job opportunities to Americans of all backgrounds, especially our veterans. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so as our vets come home for after their service to our country, we at EERE wanted to help give them a boost in, prom in this promising sector and that, is one, that has one of the highest job growth rates in the country, as shown in Solar Foundation's report. SunShot has developed a solar installation training pilot program to help them use those, the skills that they've already acquired and not just get any old job, but a career in this booming industry. The first three pilots take place at, the, at three military bases, Camp Pendleton, California, Fort Carson, Colorado, and Naval Station, Norfolk, Virginia. Each program trains transitioning military personnel on how to size and install solar energy systems and develop other related solar job skills. There is no training cost to the veteran, and the solar companies have no obligation to hire trainees, though DOE believes these veterans will be among the strongest candidates that a solar firm could wish for. The first class of Marine trainees just graduated last month at Camp Pendleton. Training courses are set to begin at Fort Carson and at Naval Station Norfolk later this spring. As we look to make it faster, easier, and cheaper for Americans to choose solar energy for their electricity needs, SunShot is doing our part to build a well-trained, skilled workforce to meet the growing demands of the solar industry. It's important to remember that our work here is cyclical. The more affordable solar gets, the faster the industry will grow, which will in turn continue to create jobs, and so we can continue to drive down costs and expand solar's presence. And that's it. So just to, just to wrap up, if SunShot and our partners can achieve our 2020 goal of cost competitive solar energy throughout the United States, that could mean the creation of 290,000 new solar jobs by 2030. So let's continue to work together to invest in this future and for our, and our growth of our clean energy economy. Thanks again for the time. Uh, that was that was terrific. Uh, let's and I should also mention that all of these presentations, all of the PowerPoints, will be up on EESI's website. Uh, I know that a lot of these charts and in terms of the handouts are pretty small. Uh, so and I, there are a lot of important facts and numbers there that you will probably want to really look at a lot more. Um, so please go to the website and and check that out. Um, are there questions or comments for our speakers? And if you could identify yourself, please. We'll start back here. Mm -hmm. I have two questions for our last two speakers. Uh, first, to the uh, speaker from, yeah, yes, you. I'm sorry, I forget your name. But we saw the downward trend in uh, in growth for the year 2012. What fully accounts for that? You mentioned China and other government policies. You're talking about that. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. about the manufacturing. Yeah, the manufacturing didn't know exactly what that was for. Thank you for clarifying. Right. So uh, one of the issues, obviously, the st the overall state of the economy uh, in the U.S. But China was definitely a a uh, big driver in that. The Chinese government decided uh, basically like five, six, well, it depends how you say it, but they basically spent $50 billion saying we want to, to have our own solar industry here in, the, here in China. And 
some people consider that to be a great gift to the world because they single-handedly have were a big factor behind uh, driving down uh, panel prices so much, which has opened up a lot of the stuff that we're we're talking about. And so it's essentially their government investment is making solar panels cheaper for people here installing in the U.S. is one perspective, although there are obviously others because manufacturers say, well, that's not, you know, fair competition and, and that kind of thing. I think the, the overall point here is that our, our companies are regaining steam. Uh, we have leadership on a lot of the high, high value IP areas and that a lot of U.S. companies are actually manufacturing abroad as well. So that's an important dynamic. So um, companies that fit the largest manufacturers here in the U.S. have some facilities here in the U.S., which are often used those panels to meet Buy America kind of provisions, but probably the bulk of their stuff is also manufactured abroad. So it's creating a global supply chain, which is probably healthy for the larger industry going forward. All right, thank you, sir. And a question for Mr. Carr regarding the, you know, it was regarding the actual downward trend in overall costs in all areas. Is that due to quicker installation times is it so due solely to do uh, quicker installation times and an increasing available availability of technology or are there other factors at play as well so there's a there are there are a number of factors uh, there are uh, a, a bunch of par pieces that make up uh, the the soft cost uh, challenge actually just a just to follow up a little bit on what uh, Amit was saying, um, and I think maybe this helps make it a little clearer too. You know, when you saw that that dip uh, in, in 2012, I mean, that was a chart by quarter, and so you're seeing a, a, a uh, you know, uh, you're gonna if you look at a supply curve uh, for any technology, looking back 10 years, it'll look pretty pretty steady. But in fact, it's made up of a lot of uh, variations over time, as as you know, supply maybe overcompensates for for demand, and then and then you know the markets tend to adjust. And uh, one of the things that uh, this administration has done is is in is in our uh, negotiations with China, they've agreed to uh, dramatically increase the amount of uh, solar that they're going to be deploying uh, domestically. So that's going to actually do a, a great deal to sort of soak up some of that uh, oversupply. Um, and so they, I think they will be, you know, there, there, there are those out there that uh, that would advocate that they may actually become a net importer at some point because they have, they have actually, uh, their commitments are so sizable. Maybe that won't happen, but the point is there's going to be some continued calibration back and forth. And we're seeing, because of the increased uh, demand here in the United States, uh, much more interest in bringing the manufacturing here closer to where they're going to use the panels. And as Amit was saying, a lot of the really valuable IP still resides here uh, throughout the value chain. On the, on the rest of it, uh, you know, Permit times matter matter a great deal. Customer acquisition is a, is a big factor in, in costs. Um, just uh, you know, just the the various ways we can sort of smooth that process. Um, but there's also things like there's balance of system costs. There's the racking costs, and you know, and we've just gotten better. We sort of there's a learning by doing in any technology. When you uh, when you do more of it, you you get better at it. And you get cheaper at it. And and I wouldn't and I I think I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the the role of third party financing like that Sun Edison and, and other companies have have uh, provided, which basically you know in my view is is just matches the capital availability better to the to the resource. You know if if you're going to have something that's going to provide value to you for 20 years, well then you know third party financing lets you sort of smooth out the the, the borrowing so that it matches it matches the uh, return on investment. Mm -hmm. Matt, did you want to add to any of that? You know, the, I think the only thing I would add was, is uh, Mike covered it well. I mean, obviously, part of the price is coming down so quickly. We're on the manufacturing side, right? And just um, the technologies being deployed and then also just the economics of what was going on back. If you looked at 2009, 2010, 2011, there was especially Europe kind of dried up very quickly and all their feet of terrors ended. 
Um, and so then the Chinese kept their factories open, right? And so you put those two things together, demand going down, supply going up, and you know what happens to the price points, right? But the, the, but the technology is now is, is, is kind of caught up to where, you know, it's, it, it's made that um, to where you can make those modules at, at lower price points and those wafers at lower price points. The other thing, though, is in construction, and I think construction just in general, um, that's where you get this insulation. It's, it's not, we're on the manufacturing side, you've had heavy efforts in terms of lean manufacturing to take waste out of the system. There hasn't been the same thing on, on the construction side. And that's where a lot of our focus is right now, is working with our EPC um, engineering, procurement, and construction partners to really make sure that they're leaning out all those, those processes that they have. Because if you just do kind of a time motion study and you watch how construction crews work, there's a lot of opportunity to squeeze waste out of there. Other questions? Okay, right here. Hey, uh, my name is Ivan. I'm from Congressman Hahn's office. I just wanted to get a better sense of uh, what the installation part of the entire industry is like. Thank you. Um, so I guess now that the industry is still like expanding and accelerating, kind of, these people have a lot of a lot of work. Assuming installing panels and everything. But when it reaches a saturation point, what is this job compared to in terms of like, is there like a lot of upkeep? Are these people going to be like working every day, maintaining existing equipment? Like, I'm, I'm not quite sure how it works, and that's what I want to find out. I, I, can, I can start with that. So a couple things. So you're right with installation, and I, I still think that will installation dry up? I don't necessarily see that for a couple of reasons. A, the economics that we just talked about. Um, B, you know, the thing you have to consider also is there's, there hasn't been a, a new nuclear facility started since 1978. If you remember, that was Three Mile Island. Um, so those plants just ran the math right here. The youngest plants are 40 years old. Your, a lot of your coal fire uh, fleet is even older than that. So a lot of those assets have to be retired. And, and what I would submit to you is just think about, well, what are you going to replace it with, right? Um, at least not, I know I don't want that stuff in my backyard, but I don't know other people's backyards, probably the same answer. The other thing is you, you alluded to is, is exactly right. Once you build these solar arrays, although there's a lot less ma maintenance in, those, in that technology than there are in others, you still have to take care of them, right? You still have to monitor them, you still have to have, and so that's one of our growing businesses is actually the services side of the business. To where necessarily, we're not necessarily employing a lot of installers, but we do employ a lot of technicians, which are even higher paid jobs. Um, folks who go in and troubleshoot things, folks who go in and maintain them on a routine basis and make sure that, that we're getting the efficiencies that we need out of those, um, out of those power plants. Yeah. I guess that's not, like, that's not comparable to, say, a plumber or something where you'd be like, oh, there's, there's something wrong with my solar panel, I'm going to call this person. It's more, is it, no, your more technicians more, are definitely that. It's a specialized thing, and it might yeah. be a local, a local thing. It might be that a person that has that kind of experience might have to travel say, I don't know, within, within a state or something. We, we, we look at it on a regional basis. You're exactly right. We have regional teams that are deployed then to some of those sites. On the wind, it's a little bit different. We actually do man some of the wind plants where there are people who are there dedicated to those plants just because, again, the technology. But on a solar side, you do it more on a regional basis. You're right. And you dispatch crews out there. I guess I would just, I mean, I think it's easiest to think of it like like the construction industry or or it can be even you know, well services in the in the oil and gas industry. I mean, you're, you know, you may drill one well or you may build one house, but then there's another house to be built and there's another and, and another and another. Uh, so, uh, you know, I glance at Google Maps and you can kind of see how big the opportunity space is for, <laughs> for, for solar, right? I mean, there's a, I think we are, uh, we are a long way from a saturation point uh, where we're even, you know, even talking about, uh, only the best possible sites, I uh, think, for decades to come. I would say that it's an advantage. One of the advantages about solar is that it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Very few moving parts. Once you get it installed, you can more or less forget about it. Um, now, from a jobs perspective, that, could be, that might be a bad thing because we want to have we want to make sure that there's always people employed in the industry. But as was mentioned, you know, solar represents less than 1% of our overall energy production. 
the sky's the limit. There's so much untapped potential out there that we are very, very far from reaching any, any type of saturation point. And so we can install lots more solar, regardless of how labor efficient we may come, re regardless of how um, little maintenance is required. The sheer numbers of workers that will be required to meet future demand is, is, is pretty significant. We're talking 290,000, 350,000. Th those are a lot of numbers over the next few dec decades. Andrew, if I can actually add really quickly, there's also a, um, panels typically have a, uh, okay, panels typically have a lifespan of around 30 years, and we haven't quite yet got to that point where you, you know, you're seeing a significant retirement of panels, but eventually the, the next generation of technology is going to lead to these installers reinstalling panels on homes that already had them. It's going to be like any other uh, infrastructure that you might have in your house. So these jobs aren't likely to go anywhere. Yeah, in, in addition to that, not only a 30-year life cycle, but there will be, you know, you'll have cost of benefits because as as the panel efficiency increases and the cost decreases, it might make sense that, hey, I only have, I have a 20-year panel that still has 10 years, but I might want to replace it just because of the efficiency. So long story short, there are going to be a lot of jobs, and, and it's going to be growing and rather than contracting at all. Okay, question back here. My name is Anton Terrell. I'm from uh, Senator Tom Udall's office. And I was wondering, with the shale boom of uh, 2014 and lowering prices at the pump, uh, does that uh, set you guys back at all? Or is that going to affect your, um, your calculations for job production? I, I've, there's been some uh, articles recently that are calling solar the next shale gale, or however you want to call the shale revolution. But certainly the, the low cost of natural gas is the major competitive to, to solar uh, when you're go thinking about as a utility or whoever putting in new assets, what, what are you going to do? It's usually pretty much a decision between natural gas and, and solar. Uh, there are some, some locations where the they're required to do a least cost uh, new generation sources, and solar is still winning out of that. And then I don't think a lot of people are really think that natural gas prices are going to be kept so artificially low in the future. So one of the benefits of going to solar, you're essentially locking in a guaranteed price for the life of the system, 25, 30 years, usually amortized over 25 years. They last longer, a little bit of panel degradation, but uh, minor. So a lot of people are making that uh, calculation uh, about whether it works. And the reality is it's probably not necessarily mutually exclusive because gas is an important pairing with solar in a lot of circumstances, particularly when you think about the intermittency of some of the sources on, on, and on a utility scale that gas is an important uh, backup. Yeah, I think just... As Ami was saying, it's it's really it's it's more about what time scale you're going to look at if you're going to if you're if you're looking more than a few years into the future, as most utilities uh, need to do, uh, then solar the just the raw economics of solar still look look very good. Um, they do pair very very well together, and I think that's that's an important. Uh, piece of it. Um, but I think the other factor that that you'll hear from utility executives and and uh, and uh, others actually in, in, at the state and, and local level is uh, having some diversity is in itself a, uh, a way to reduce risk overall. Um, so there's, there's no volatility in, in the electrons from the sun. So um, the, uh, I, you know, I think you, again, I think you still have a very, very high ceiling for uh, solar penetration before you start talking about things being sort of crowding each other out uh, in, in the energy space. And one other thing I just wanted to add, you know, from one of the very interesting things that why well, I'm interested in solar is its potential to be disruptive in terms of the current uh, electricity model where we have a 100-year-old model of central generalized, general, centralized generation uh, and, you know, one large company owning that and then you buy electricity as you use it. Solar has this potential where homeowners can buy their panels themselves and take more control of their their energy. Uh, so that is a unique uh, thing that even wind or other renewable energies can't provide that I think 
might put it at a different footing than say uh, straight natural gas on a on a uh, cost per watt analysis. Okay, we've got a few more questions, and actually that raised another question that I'd like to ask too. But um, okay, here and then back here, and then to you. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Eric Cameron. I'm with Senator Bill Nelson's office from Florida. And I just had a quick question about um, productions going beyond 2015, 2016, as far as the solar industry. In those studies, or if there have been done any by the Department of Energy, um, do you take into account the, the clean power plan and its effects? Because in a state like Florida, we don't have a renewable portfolio standard. I was wondering if in states that don't have that renewable portfolio standard, when they do have, uh, have to abide by certain um, levels of renewable energy with the clean power plan, will that make a significant difference and is that taken into account? In, in general, um, they're, they're not built into our studies. Uh, that's, that's an exogenous factor for, for, for our models. Um, it, you know, I, I, partially because we can't really foresee exactly the way that'll that'll all play out and um, and the clean power plan you know does have a, a lot of different pathways for for achieving the reductions uh, in in it so um, I, I think it's you know we regard solar as one of the more exciting and sort of viable pathways to, to go down um, and you know it, you know the the biggest I think challenge for any of these new technologies is I think as Amita alluded to earlier is they're essentially competing with an already paid for resource in many cases. And so uh, whether you whether you do it by beginning to measure the the externalities associated with it or you or you simply, you know, uh, begin to reassess your investment profile, um, I think that you know that Solar rises to the top of one of those uh, one of those investments that you're likely to make yeah, to achieve that. But no, it's not in our it's not in our current modeling. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, you know, just add a add a factor to what to what we have uh, if you if you really want to uh, drill down on that. I think uh, it's not in the models because there's so much, you know, uncertainty of how things will play out in the state by state plans. But I think the larger question that's been talked about a little bit, what is that? When you're you got this huge, literally trillions of dollars of investment that need to be made to replace plants, and is that a driver there in deciding? Well, do I just replace it with the existing coal or natural gas, or do I think about solar now that the economics work better? Uh, so that's where EPA uh, is an important like you know factor in terms of uh, how people are thinking about. Well, we need do need to meet the standard. What are we going to do? I mean, Florida's got a lot of other issues, being. You know, very sunny state, but having policies like they don't allow third-party financing and things like that, which has really slowed down the solar industry relative to its potential. So those might actually changes to those policy. I would argue to have a much bigger effect than the EPA's big power plan. Okay, great. Hi, Harrison Myers from Congressman Garamendi's office. Uh, Mr. Ronan, you talked about disruption within this new solar uh, industry. One of the things that always irked me is as much as you go solar, you're still liable to the grid in the sense that I'm from California, and even though there may be, you may be on solar, if there's a blackout in your region, you're still susceptible to that, and in some cases, so there's no personal storage of the energy. I was wondering if any of the panelists can address that. Going forward, I'm not a scientist, so is there any you know, applicability of maybe storing your own personal energy instead of giving it back and then waiting for it, so to speak? Uh, I'll just talk briefly, Mac, and uh, obviously that's a lot of the tension that's happening now is that people essentially are using the electricity grid as their, their backup battery, right? This giant battery, when you have extra power, you sell it to them, you need power, you use it. Uh, there's definitely a future, and a lot of people are seeing this as the next sort of solar-sized growth area in storage, and that storage can come in a lot of different levels at the uh, what in the level you're talking about sort of the homeowners that you just have the batteries in the basement and you can disconnect from your your grid entirely that uh, frightens utilities a lot they've called this they call it a death spiral <laughs> we'll get into all that but um, that in technology is already there today it's not economic in a couple of years it will be uh, increasingly economic and that might be a future where you see significant uh, 
investment and from a homeowner's perspective some of it is because they want to make sure they always have power some people hate their utilities and and want to get out of it i mean you're seeing an interesting dynamic politically where a lot of tea party uh, folks are very pro-solar because they've like from the libertarian type streak they want to control their power so you have these green tea party they call it coalitions in several states in georgia and and others where they these diverse uh, views politically are teaming together to try and open up the solar market from different perspectives. Yeah, it's really a question of economics. I mean, we, we actually have in, in areas where that do not have solar and we're bringing light or, or do not have electricity and we're bringing solar to them in maybe a village in Nicaragua or, or somewhere in India or, or in Africa, we actually have self-contained units. They have the solar panels, they have an inverter there, and they have batteries on the bottom. And, you know, so the only question is how much do you want to spend for those? Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. I think right now uh, a kilowatt of storage will cost you about $400 per kilowatt, I think is what it is. I haven't seen numbers lately. My guess is, the trend lines that I see, that drops in half in less than five years. Um, and, and that's where a real re revolution begins to take off because we already talk about hybrid solutions when you mix storage with other kind of fuel sources. But once you start having that storage, then your need to mix it with other fuel, it goes down tremendously. So, you know, a lot of tremendous opportunity with, with storage. And there's a lot of good, smart people working on it right now. And I, I really do think those, you'll see those curves happen. I guess we Story invested. Could be your uh, electric car. Yeah. You know, this is exactly. something you exactly. paid for for a whole different reason, electric car, but it actually has a tremendous battery capacity built into it that you could all you can run your house for a couple of days on just a couple of gallons of gas, or you can put your power into it. So that's another interesting dynamic. But there's very complex uh, network to put all these things together and get everything to talk to each other. But there is a lot of work going on in that whole area, and I was just going to say I think. We invested at the wrong time then or whatever. But, but the thing is, um, at my house, we actually do have batteries connected to our solar system because we have been very concerned about making sure that our sump pump would run when there are terrible, terrible downpours, you know, like in, in terms of hurricanes when we've been without power for five days here in the district. So anyway, there, there are all sorts of reasons and values with regard to those kinds of investments. Okay, question right here. Um, I'm Alex from uh, Congresswoman Kathleen Rice's office, and um, it seems like there's a lot of growth in the solar industry without the help of Congress except for um, extending tax cuts and um, what would you like to see coming from some of our offices and like what kind of support would you want from members and senators that you don't already have or need? I think they've all been waiting for that question. <laughs> Thank you. We should just go right down, right down the row. Uh, okay. do, yeah. yeah, do you want to start, Andrea? Sure. That's fine. Um, well, I'm not at all in a position to take a policy stance. We are a strict C3 nonprofit, but what companies are telling us is that they love and need policy stability. They need long-term set and stable policies, whether it's the ITC, whether it's a renewable portfolio standard that they can count on, whether it's net metering that works and pencils out, whether it's third-party financing. Um, so really, it's the certainty and stability. Now. Maybe you will like to take a more pointed approach to that good question. <laughs> no, I, I mean I think it's it's all in those areas, right? It's mm -hmm. it's uh, st you know we, we know what happens when there's instability in business situations, and you know whether it's you look at what businesses do or what Wall Street does, right? They don't like uncertainty. So the more certainty you can have around policies, always always works to everyone's benefit. And I think that exactly those areas that you were talking about, um, tax credits, net metering, permitting. Um, third-party financing, all those types of things, and bring some stability and a point of view to that, I think would help the industry greatly. I'd, uh, first, I'd make a distinction between your federal side policy and your state side policy, because uh, some of the stuff, we have a 50-state electricity policy here in the U.S., which makes things very messy, uh, or laboratories of in innovation, as you <laughs> saw from who's getting the solar jobs and who's not. But the stuff like that's RPS and permitting and, and things like that, 
Uh, those are generally, and net metering very importantly, are uh, state policies by and large. The feds can't really touch that or just try and drop a bill and then you'll see a NARU come down on you pretty hard. Uh, but there are some important federal drivers that we, we've talked about. The ITC investment tax credit, so it's currently the 30% expires at the end of 2016. If there can be some certainty in terms of how that goes forward, uh, we can avoid a lot of uh, a cliff situation there. One thing we haven't talked about that's very important in the, in the tax regime, uh, when we've done some analysis on this, can send you if you're interested, but there's a lot of a lot of the uh, proposed changes in tax reform also uh, make a lot of uh, changes to depreciation schedules, and the de current depreciation schedules are probably as important in a lot of cases for for solar investment in terms of uh, the economics. So maintaining those schedules are uh, important, and then the feds can do a lot on leveling the playing field, I would think, on terms of my last point in my presentation in terms of uh, providing, taking away other embedded subsidies that go to other players so that um, that actually makes solar look better. And uh, so similar to uh, Andrea, I'm, uh, we, we don't, we can't uh, advocate and uh, so, I guess I would just uh, I would echo the, the sentiment. We, we've heard the same things, you know, the, the stability of policy, the stability uh, uh, in in whatever, however you want to handle it, um, ha is 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 really the key. And you know, sort of returning to my days working for the committee, I mean, we certainly saw this in other technologies. Wind, arguably. Is, was sort of like a, a decade or so ahead of solar in, in, in its in its cost curve, and uh, the interruptions in its incentive structure uh, cost it dearly in the in 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 bringing down the cost curve. And uh, we actually saw a pretty dramatic uh, turnaround in the manufacturing in, in the United States, which has bounced back, but you know is now again in a precarious uh, spot. So that's you know. It, that's just history. That's that's what we've seen uh, before with these technologies, um, and I guess the the last thing I think to keep in mind is you know, is I think part of what we're showing here is you know what those federal investments are buying. You know, we're going to keep doing our job and trying to push down these costs, and and I think we have some great programs to do that, and um, so uh, you know we feel very good about about the sort of the cost benefit analysis of what of what our investments are yielding. Uh, but the the larger investments in the in the deployment side, um, you know, they they play out in jobs, they play out in cleaner air, they play out in uh, in increased diversity and opportunity. So, uh, you know, you guys can make your own call, calls on that. I just add to that. So the industry is a fifteen billion dollar industry now. You know, this is several billion dollars more each year. If you look at the Sunshot investment, it's just a fraction of that. So uh, the president has an aggressive uh, budget rec. Uh, request from Congress on that level, uh, probably unrealistic given the times. But uh, oh, did I say that? <laughs> uh, but in, you know, there's there's certain levels where you can keep important programs uh, going. And then, you know, on this larger issue in terms of solar is now, uh, as in, when in whenever there's a, th a th uh, threat to an incumbent industry, you're seeing a lot of new attacks on solar that are very well coordinated. There was a, a report that came out last week from. Uh, 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 I won't. <laughs> okay, they rhyme, sounds like a soda name. Uh, funded industry, um, and this was very coordinated. There's a lot of uh, m misleading uh, statistics that were used there, um, and you see this. Everybody has heard of Solyndra in terms of this. You know, this is why solar is never going to work. There's a mythology about solar uh, can never work without price subsidies. I think we've shown some of the, the price trends of that. Certainly not true. The reality with the loan guarantee program, which, by the way, Mike Carr wrote in 2005, <laughs> <laughs> and he should be proud of it. So the uh, that was that was Republican past Congress. Republican president signed that. Uh, that investment. So there's a lot of talk about Solyndra losing their $535 million. The reality is that the program has already turned to the government $800 million in interest payments, which is more than the losses occurred by the three most famous defaults of Solyndra, Fisker, and Abound Solar. And it's projected to increase uh, federal revenues by $5 billion over the next 20 years for off the interest of the of the program. So you're getting a boost to these technologies. So take the CSB example, the concentrating solar plant. 
the loan program worked, I think, as it was intended. It funded the first five major projects in the U.S., which wouldn't have happened without that program. And since then, 17 other uh, large facilities, there wasn't a, a uh, facility, a solar farm in the U.S. over 100 megawatts before 2009. 17 have been privately financed without any government uh, support. So that's an example of a DOE program that worked to get a nascent industry. They have to, it has to be proven before the banks will ever touch it. But that's where the government came in and lended that support. And now there's a new industries and they're selling all over the world. They're talking to other, the companies that build those CSP plants are also now talking to Saudi Arabia and other places about building the same thing. Um, and I think, you know, one, one thing I'd like to add to that, I mean, because I, I do hear that quite a bit with uh, solar companies going out of business. And when you have a new industry, guess what? There are companies that are going out of business because you're going to have to get the business model and the economics right. You know, I'll, I'll just remind you, in, in 1901, there were 2,000 car companies in the United States. Um, they didn't all survive. In fact, very few survived. I think three, right? Okay, so um, not to say that we'll have that same rate of consolidation, but you'll see that happen. There'll be certain models that just don't plain work. Um, so if anyone wants more specifics in terms of what we're looking, I'd love to set you up with our government affairs folks too. Um, that's, that they would probably be more poignant in terms of, uh, of their ask of Congress. Any last question? There, there are lots of things to discuss yet, but we're past our time. So any last, last question? Otherwise, feel free to follow up with, with any of our speakers or with us at EESI. Um, I, the discussion was great. So, and I want to thank all of our panelists. And I want to thank all of you for asking some very, very good questions. So. Uh, we hope to see you at another EESI briefing again very soon and look forward to working with all of you in terms of looking at how this also fits into the clean power plan, what's happening with regard to utilities in terms of looking at utility scale versus um, totally distributed uh, because we also know that there are a lot of issues underway too in terms of thinking about greater resilience across the country as we deal with more and more extreme weather events and disruptions. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you.